All right, good afternoon. <clears throat> good morning to All right, we were talking about um, permutations and combinations, and we went through the formulae for both of those, and we looked at some um, applications, some sample problems, and so on, and then we were going to talk a little more about combinations and then go into um, binomial coefficients and Pascal's triangle and all kinds of good stuff. Um, so any questions before we start on that? Let me hop on the canvas quickly. Was there any requirement for how our output was supposed to be formatted on uh, the list of sum of two primes for Goldbach's conjecture? Nope, just show me the uh, even number and the two primes that add up to it in some way, shape, or form, and, uh, and you're good to go. Cool, thanks. All right. All right, last chance to turn in your assignment. This is going to close in five minutes. So whatever you've got for... Um, for your programming assignment for CSE 215, turn that in right now because it's going to close in four and a half minutes. And you want to get at least partial credit, um, <clears throat> yes, in some way, shape, or form. Excellent. All right, uh, and let's see, homework question 2.1 number five. Sure, we can go over that. Um, so let me pull up the homework. Let's see, 2.1 number 5. Honor Society wishes a picture to be taken of its six officers. There will be two rows of three people. How many different ways can the six officers be arranged? So, um, six people, you're looking for the number of arrangements. The order is significant, right? You're going to use all six people for the picture, so the only thing that's, that's different here is the order in which they're standing. Um, the fact that they're in two rows is a bit of a red herring. Right? Really, all we need to do is think of, you know, six positions and six people. And we're going to put these into, you know, some assignment of these people into these six positions. And whether this is, you know, two rows of three or one row of six or, you know, if they're standing one in front of another in six rows, doesn't make any difference. The question is the same in all cases, which is, how many ways can we rearrange these six people? So this is the number of six permutations. Uh, let's see. Order matters. Yeah, this is the number of six permutations of six people. So remind me again, iterations versus permutations versus choose. So, so permutations... These are ordered, and that's n factorial over n minus r factorial. Combinations, these are unordered, and we sometimes write it like this, and that's n factorial over n minus r factorial, but then also divided by r factorial. So it's just got that extra factor in the denominator. And this is sometimes referred to as N choose R. So there's a permutations, combinations. And did we talk about iteration or is that am I just making that up? I think you're making that up. I mean that's a that's a programming term. 
But yeah, the only things we talked about here were permutations and combinations. And yeah, not 36, but you probably don't want to type the answer in chat. Because then everybody's got the answer and I don't grade that one. So we're finishing up week eight here. We're going to finish talking about counting today. We're going to talk a little more about combinations, look at some more applications, um, binomial theorem, Pascal's triangle. I'm going to wrap up by talking about recurrence relations a little bit. And then um, next week we're going to talk about graph theory. And, and this is a good computer science topic. We'll, we'll talk about ways to do things like find shortest paths or more generally how to work with graphs in the memory of a computer, ways to represent them, and so on and so forth. We'll end with Dijkstra's algorithm, which is a shortest path algorithm um, that you'll almost certainly encounter in future courses um, in various ways. And that will take us to week 10, our final week, which we'll spend talking about languages and grammars, um, models of computation, state machines, Turing machines, limits of computation, all kinds of stuff like that. So it's going to be it's going to be a pretty packed in next um, seven classes, um, and then you're done with two fifteen. So, all right. So let's let's continue talking about um, combinations. Yeah, only seven more classes. Um, All right, so here's our formula for, for number of R combinations of N objects. And it's just the number of ordered arrangements divided by the number of possible orderings. So we treat two things in a, that are the same elements, but in a different order, we treat them as being the same. Um, and, and we looked at some, some examples of this, right? So um, pick three people out of ten. And we're not choosing, you know, who's first, who's second, who's third. We're just looking for a group of three people out of ten. That's just C, ten comma three, which is ten factorial over seven factorial times three factorial. And an interesting thing to note is suppose I had said, let's pick seven people out of ten. Well, that's C, 10, 7. And according to our formula, that's 10 factorial over 3 factorial times 7 factorial. That's exactly the same as C, 10, 3. Now, is that surprising? That picking 3 people can be done the same number of ways as picking 7 people? Is that surprising or is that obvious? Or is it neither? Both. Nice. And the uncertainty principle might be true, but I'm not sure. Seven and ten are, or seven and three are related to ten, but I don't think it's related to ten. Seven and ten are re seven and three are related to ten. If you have a group of ten people. And you want to pick three of them to to you know win a prize. That's exactly the same thing as picking seven of them who are not going to win a prize. If I'm picking three people to come into some some separate group, that's the same thing as picking seven people who don't go into that separate group. The number of ways I can do this has got to be the same as the number of ways I can do that. So yeah, this is not a coincidence. This is this is the case for a good reason. And you can see it from the formula. Right? If I if I replace R with n minus R, my denominator is going to be exactly the same. It's 
So yeah, so our recurring theme, simple once you see it, um, but but not at all obvious before that usually. Um, so that's that's um, that's an interesting thing about combinations, and we're going to come back to this in some different ways. Um, let's let's do a sample problem related to combinations. Um, given n bit numbers, so we're going to fix n, say it's h, so we're going to talk about 8 bit numbers, um, how many n bit numbers contain exactly r ones? So for example, let's set n equal to 4. So what are our 4 bit numbers? I haven't written this in almost a year, but spring term is coming, so I'll be writing this like in my sleep pretty soon. So this is, you know, all the 8 bit numbers. And have you ever looked at these and counted how many ones are in each of these? So let's see how many ones we have in these. So 0, 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 2, 3, 1, 2, 2, 3, 2, 3, 3, 4. You may be flashing back to a 250 lab at this point. That's okay. So how many, how many... For a given R number of four bit strings with R ones. So, how many strings contain no ones? Well, it's just one, it's this number right here. How many contain a single one? One, two, three, four of them. How many contain two ones? One, two, three, four, five, six. How many contain three ones? One, two, three, four. And how many contain four ones? Um, looks like it's just this one down here, so there's one of those. So the number of, of n bit strings with r ones for n equals four looks like this. And these turn out to be combinations. So if we just think about n bits and r ones, well, if we have n bits, <clears throat> and we want exactly r ones, that's basically choosing. Let me number my bits. One, two, three, four, up to bit n. If we want r ones, we're basically choosing which of these n bits should be equal to one. And if we want r bits to be equal to one, we're choosing r bit positions out of n possible choices. And the order in which we choose doesn't matter. If I say I want a number where bits 2, 3, and 4 are equal to 1, I'm going to get the same number as if I said I want bits 3, 4, and 2 to be equal to 1. The order in which I choose these R bits that will be 1 doesn't make any difference. So this is a combination, and it's just N choose R. Yeah, it is a number palindrome. And there's a reason. All right. So everybody everybody see this so far? The number of n bit strings containing r ones will be c n comma r or n choose r.
and along the lines of what we did a few minutes ago, the number of n-bit strings containing r zeros is related to this. Suppose I want, you know, 8-bit strings and I want two ones. Well, if I'm choosing an 8-bit string with two ones, I'm also choosing an 8-bit string with six zeros. Because every bit's either a one or a zero. So the number of ways I can choose two ones out of eight should be the same as the number of ways I can choose six zeros out of eight. So back on our four bit example, this was the number of ways to choose a four bit string with zero ones. If I choose a string with zero ones, I'm choosing a string with four zeros. Let me put that differently. If I'm choosing a string with zero, with zero ones. So I'm choosing a string with zero ones, that means I'm choosing a string with four um, zeros. So this is choose four comma zero. It should also be the same as choose four comma four. Down here I'm choosing a string with four ones, that's choose four comma four. But if I'm picking a string with four ones, I'm also picking a string with zero zeros. And how many ways can I choose a four bit string with zero zeros? That's choose four comma zero. So these two have got to be the same. And similarly here, I'm choosing something that contains a single one. That's the same as choosing something that contains three zeros. And how many ways can I find a string with three zeros? The same number of ways as finding a string with three ones. Different strings, but the same count. So these have got to be equal to each other. Now what do I get if I add up all five of these numbers? Here's a higher. 16. sixteen, thank you. I get sixteen. What's the significance of sixteen? That's the number of four bits. <laughs> Yeah, it's 2 to the 4th. It's the number of 4-bit binary numbers. So think about this formula. If I add up each of those combinations, quick guess, what do you think I'm going to get? There's obviously a trick here. Two to the eighth. So why is it 2 to the 8th? Think about that counting argument we just did for 4-bit numbers. This is the number of 8-bit strings containing no 1s. This is the number of strings containing a single 1, 2 1s, 3 1s, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8 1s. And these are disjoint sets. If a number contains three ones, it doesn't contain two ones or four ones. It contains three ones. And any 8-bit number contains either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8 ones. And so if I add up the number of each of these, I should get the total number of 8-bit numbers, which is 2 to the 8th. And this works in general. So the sum from 0 to n of n choose i 
is equal to 2 to the n. Which leads us to a really interesting looking formula that relates factorials and summations to powers of 2. That's weird. I think that's weird. Because factorials are these big, long numbers that grow horrifically fast. And, and the fact that this is always an integer is a little strange by itself. But you add all these up and you just get a power of 2. And that's kind of cool. And what's a power of 2 look like in binary? It's 1 followed by a bunch of zeros. And somehow when you take factorials, which is multiplication, which looks weird in binary, and it's some division, and you add all those up, everything cancels everything, and you end up with zeros everywhere except in that first position. That's pretty weird. Yeah, cool slash unsettling. All right, so this is, this is, this is a nice fact um, about combinations. All right, so we're going to continue down this rabbit hole. So, A and B are just numbers. A plus B to the 0 is 1. A plus B to the 1 is just A plus B. A plus B squared is A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. A plus B cubed is A cubed plus 3A squared B plus 3AB squared plus B cubed. A plus B to the 4th. I'll stop after this one. And we can go on. And you can find these by foiling, right? I could take this and multiply by A plus B, and I'll get some kind of, of expression. And in general, if I write a plus b to the n, I'm going to have some term involving a to the n, some term involving a to the n minus 1 times b, something involving a to the n minus 2 b squared, dot, 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 plus a times b to the n minus 1, plus something times b to the n. And if you multiply these out by hand and you play with it a little, what you'll see is that each of these monomials, the coefficients of a and b always add up to 4, or 3, or n. And that's not too hard to see by playing with this, and you can actually prove it with, with a little induction argument. But what's interesting is, what are these coefficients? And we can probably guess that the first and last coefficients are always going to be 1. Right? If I multiply this by a plus b, I'm going to get a 1a to the 5th. And I'm going to get a 1b to the 5th. But the stuff in the middle, who knows? Well, if you look at the a plus b to the 4th, my coefficients were 1, 4, 6... 4 and 1. Ring a bell? Right? Those were these coefficients that we saw here when we were looking at bit strings. These are combinations. 
Uh, you could find the nth coefficient through linear algebra methods. Uh, depending on what you consider a linear algebra method, probably. Um, you can do it with plain old multiplication, too. But you can also do it by looking at combinations. And so there's this, this theorem called the binomial theorem that I'm pretty sure you've encountered, although I don't know exactly where, which says something like this. If you want to take a plus b to the n, just write down, you know, your pairs of a and b, starting with, you know, a to the 0, b to the n, a to the 1, b to the n minus 1, a squared, b to the n minus 2, and so on, and your coefficient in front of each one is just n choose i. Probably calc 3 or something like that. So yeah, that's the binomial theorem. And so if you're, if you're good at knowing what, what combinations look like, right, or if you're good at multiplying and dividing factorials, um, you, can, you can write down the expression for, you know, a plus b to the whatever without having to actually multiply it out. And why does this work? Um, I'd like you to see this, but it's it's a hard thing to convey. But let me let me take one shot at it, and and however much this makes sense is is good. Um, suppose I'm calculating a plus b to the nth. Okay, let's just do a plus b to the eighth. Okay, so this is a plus b, a plus b. I should have done a smaller number. Could have been worse. I could have done the 20th. All right. So this is what a plus b to the eighth is. And we know that we're going to get, you know, some combination of something times a to the something times b to the something, right? If we were going to foil this like an extreme foil, um, what we would do is we would take the first expression in each term and a times A times A times A, right? So that's going to give us an A to the eighth. And then we might do, you know, the first element in each term, except the last one, and here we'll take a B. And that's going to give us an A to the seventh times B. And we might, you know, take the first element in six of these terms and take B in two of these, and that's going to give us an A to the sixth B squared. Or we might take the last element in each of these terms, and that would give us a b to the eighth. And so we're certainly going to get some combination of things in this form, right? And what's unknown is what the coefficient is. Well, let's look at the coefficient for a to the eighth. My goal here is to choose either a or b from each of these eight expressions and multiply those together. If I want to get an a to the eighth, I have to choose a from eight of these expressions. So I have eight terms here and I want to choose a from eight of them. How many ways can I do that? That's eight choose eight. Now suppose I want to see um, what my coefficient will be for a to the seventh b. So I'm, I'm doing all combinations of choosing one element from each of these eight terms and multiplying them together. And my question is, how many times will that give me a to the seventh times b? And I could, you know, pick b from here or here or here or here or any of those. There's eight ways I can do that. But more generally, what are we doing? We're saying, I want to choose seven of these terms to pick an A from, and one to pick a B. So how many ways can I choose seven of these eight things to pick an A from? That's just 
HU7. And if I want to get an A to the 6th B squared, any time that I choose A from 6 of these and B from the other 2, when I multiply those, I'm going to get A to the 6th B squared. So how many different ways can I choose 6 of these terms to pull an A from? That's A choose 6, and so on. So that's the tie-in between, between multiplication of, of binomials and the choice function, number of, com number of combinations. And like I say, if that's fuzzy or blurry or not quite there, that's totally fine. Um, that, I think, takes a, a more concentrated level of, of thinking about this than, than we're spending on it right now in class. But, um, but you can come back to it periodically and, and think about it. Or the next time that you encounter uh, binomial expansion, right, you might find this again, and it might make more sense. But let's go on to the fun stuff. Um, the more fun stuff. So Pascal's triangle. So Pascal's triangle is is this structure that you get. Um, you can you can draw this pretty easily without doing a whole lot of of work. Um, start off with a one. And on your next row, put down a pair of ones. Now each row is going to be one number longer, and each row is going to begin and end with a one. And in between, I'm just going to write down the sum of the two numbers above it. So 1 plus 1 is 2. Next row, I'm going to write down 1's on the end, and each number in the middle, I'll just write the sum of the two numbers above it. 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 1 is 3. Next row starts and ends with a 1. 1 plus 3 is 4. 3 plus 3 is 6. 3 plus 1 is 4. And guess what? We've got that number again, right? One four six four one. So this is a way to find values of the choice function. This is also a way to find the coefficients of a polynomial. So a plus b to the 8th is a to the 8th plus 8a to the 7th b plus 28a to the 6th b squared, 56a to the 5th b cubed, and so on and so forth. So this is a cool shape to know. And this triangle is filled with all kinds of interesting characteristics. So for one thing, um, you know, it gives us the number of, of combinations. So if we go down to a certain row and we move across a certain amount, it's the number of ways we can choose that many things out of that many objects. And that's, that's pretty immediately useful. The outside diagonals are all composed of ones. The second diagonal is consecutive integers. This third diagonal, what do you think those numbers are? So 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28. 
Pattern matching for fun and profit. These are the so-called triangular numbers. So 15 is the sum of the first five integers. 21 is the sum of the first six integers. 28 is the sum of the first seven integers. Which means these are also n times n plus one divided by two. I used to give PAs on Pascal's triangle sometimes. Um, yeah, it adds a consecutive integers, perfect. Um, I'm not going to do a second programming assignment for 215 because we're getting pretty close to the end of the term and um, 222 is still going pretty high rev and I'm guessing that physics and, and linear are pretty busy right now so, um, so I'm not going to do another PA for 215 um, but you can code this up if you want anyway and it's, it's a fun thing to code alright so these are triangular numbers right um, which is kind of cool, um, because it's a triangle, right? Um, what do you get if you add the elements in each row? I don't think I'm going to do an extra credit assignment for this class, but like I say, code it up anyway. It's a fun thing to code. It's, it's pretty satisfying. So what do you get if you add across each row? You get 2 to the n, right? This is 1, this is 2, this is 4, this is 8, this is 16, and that's just another observation of this, this fact we stated a while ago that if you add up the number of um, R combinations of N objects as R goes from 0 to N, you get 2 to the N. So you can add up each row, get a power of 2. That's kind of cool, right? Now what if we add up the square of each element? Yeah, the first row is zero. So what if we add up the square of each element? So one squared is just one. One squared plus one squared is two. One squared plus two squared plus four squared plus one squared. That's four plus two is six. This fourth row will be 1 plus 9 plus 9 plus 1 is 20. This fifth row will be 1 plus 16 is 17. 34 plus 36 will be 70. So adding up the square of each element gives us 1, 2, 6, 20, 70. which happen to be these numbers going down the middle line. Yeah. So the sum of the squares on row R is equal to the middle element on row 2 times R. I think maybe he was. <laughs> All right, here's another one. So let's ignore the ones on the side. And let's just look at all the numbers in between the first and last number. And let's look at row R. So, so this is row 0, row 1 row 2, row 3, 4, 5, 
six, seven, H. And if we ignore the things on the edges, we can ask, are the numbers in between divisible by the row number? And I'm not going to worry about row 0 and 1 because they don't have anything in between the, the ones on the end. But looking here, the only thing in the middle is 2, and 2 is divisible by 2. And over here we have a 3 and a 3, and both of those are divisible by 3. 4 is divisible by 4, but 6 is not. 5, 10, 10, 5, those are all divisible by 5. 15, 20, not divisible by 6. 7, 21, 35, divisible by 7. 70, not divisible by 8. And if we were to go down to row 9, um, 1, 9, and 36, and... 84 and 126 and I'm pretty sure let me check yeah 84 is not divisible by 9 so this is not divisible so which ones are divisible by 9 2 3 5 7 the prime numbers. So in row R, all the numbers in the middle are divisible by R if and only if R is prime. So now we got a connection between combinations, powers of two, binomials, and prime numbers, and factorials. I would bet the golden ratio shows up somewhere. At least indirectly, it definitely does. Yeah, if you don't know the golden ratio, go ahead and watch some number file videos on YouTube. Um, it's, it's a fascinating topic, and it touches just about everything that you encounter in nature, in music, in marketing. Um, it, it permeates everything if you listen to popular music and you break it down into, you know, a refrain and a chorus and a breakdown section and you look at the length of those different pieces of, of the music, um, you can find a ratio of those that corresponds to the ratio of certain aspects of Da Vinci's paintings, for example. Um, it's, it's all kind of related. I shouldn't have thrown away Pascal's triangle so quickly. All right, um, even greater weirdness. <coughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so let's just look at each of these, these rows. This first thing looks like the number one. This looks like the number 11. This looks like the number 121. This looks like the number 1,331. This looks like the number 14641. Well, 11 squared is 121. 11 cubed is 1,331. 11 to the fourth is 14,641. So each row of Pascal's triangle is basically giving us a higher power of 11. And it kind of breaks down here because 10 is not a digit. But if I did this in hex, right, this would be the hex number for for 11 to the fifth. Yeah, why 11? It has to do with this business of adding the two things above you and thinking of a ones place and a tens place. So all of this can send you down a bunch of rabbit holes and it's really fun. Um, maybe not when you have other work to do, but, but spring break, if you find a chance to sit outside and look at the sky, these are good things to ponder. They can take to some really crazy places. You don't get this part. So I'm just reading across each row, 14641, that's the value of 11 to the fourth. Reading across here, 1331, that's the value of 11 cubed. 
I, I don't get why lemon is the, uh, is the base. Oh, I did a really quick answer to that. I don't expect that to, like, impart great understanding. Um, but if you, if you think about this as a decimal number and you ask what number you get by, you know, writing each digit as a sum of the things above here, it's the same as multiplying this by 11. Um, so 1331 times 11, what do we get? 1331 and 1331. And so my first digit is a 1. My next digit is this plus this. My next digit is basically this plus this. My next digit is that plus that. And then my last digit is just the same 1. And that's, that's in effect what's happening when you write down each number by summing the two numbers above it. So that was a slightly more detailed explanation, but still pretty fast. But play with it. Um, explore it. So, so I had a student who turned this into their SLP, um, and I think actually got a paper uh, published on it, they they um, expanded this idea into a, a base infinity number system that um, would let you continue this, you know, indefinitely and represent each row as a power of eleven. Bit more confused now, I think. Good. That means you're probably on the path to understanding, because because most pathways to understanding involve confusion. Um, kick it around and and. Ask me about it later if if uh, if you want to think about it more. And I don't necessarily understand why Pascal's triangle has anything to do with adding up the numbers above it, but that's how I first learned it when I first encountered this. Um, and I think you have to work to to um, to pull that out. So you can you can go online and and find pages that talk about Pascal's triangle. So you know here's the one we did with primes. We're in a prime row. Each number is divisible by the row number. Here's the powers of two that you get by adding up. There's the magic elevens. So powers of of eleven. Um, there's there's the weird hockey stick pattern. Um, so, so go down a diagonal and then change direction, and this number is the sum of the things on the diagonal. So here we went down four spots and then jumped over to the right, and the sum of those is 120. Triangular numbers we talked about. Um, square numbers we talked about. Did we do this picture? Square numbers. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, Fibonacci numbers. So if you add up each diagonal, you get the Fibonacci sequence. We're going to talk about Fibonacci numbers in a bit, but that's related to golden ratio. So if you haven't encountered Fibonacci numbers, check that out, um, and we'll, we'll talk about them in a little bit. Um, yep, so, so they're definitely related. So um, add up along each diagonal, and you get this Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci is basically it's a sequence where each number is the sum of the two previous terms in the sequence. So 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13. So those are sitting in this triangle. There's also this thing called Catalan numbers, which have to do with how many ways you can subdivide a polynomial into triangles. So a triangle can only be partitioned one way. A square can be partitioned into two separate sets of triangles. Um, a a six-sided polygon can be partitioned 14 ways. I don't know what happened to the five-sided one here. Um, but you can find those numbers by taking each middle number and subtracting the number to the right. So 6 minus 4 is 2, 20 minus 15 is 5, and so on. Binomial expansion we talked about. Here's a really cool one. Fractals. So Sierpinski's triangle. So if you shade in all of the even numbers in the triangle, you get this this fractal slash recursive shape that is self-referential. And if you drew this on a really big picture, you'd get something that looks like a fractal. Um, 
where no matter what scale you look at it, it always looks the same. And fractals are another really cool area that, that um, if you haven't looked at those, it's definitely worth taking a look at some, some videos. Um, fractals are everywhere, and, and fractional dimensions of objects, objects that are 2.3 dimensions instead of, you know, 2 or 3, things like that. Um, how many triangles can you, you, how many ways can you subdivide a hypercube in triangles? It sounds like the start of a joke. Um, or you could do hyper triangles. So Pascal's triangle is, is one of these things that's just like filled with, with, um, with all kinds of, of uh, interesting properties. Yeah, fractals are definitely recursive, right? Except they don't have a base case. They, they keep recursing forever. Um, and, and if you haven't encountered fractals, here's, here's a starting point. Um, suppose you were to measure the coastline of a country, right? So you could take a picture of it or something and you could, you know, get a piece of dental floss and match the coastline and then figure out how long that is and use your scale and estimate what the length of the coastline was, right? Um, and if you, you were to actually travel the coast, you could walk along the coastline and get a better measurement, right? Use your Fitbit or something to track your distance. Um, but it depends how closely you follow the coastline. So maybe the, the coast is, you know, doing something like this, and maybe there's a little jog there along the side of the beach. Well, if I walk straight along here, I'm going to get a slightly shorter distance than if I actually follow this little indent, right? That's like half an inch, right? But the closer you look at this border of the water or the land, the more you see all these little imperfections. And the more you follow those imperfections, the longer the coastline ends up being. And in a limit, if you measure this with infinite precision, your coastline ends up being infinitely long. And that's a little weird because, you know, maybe the top of the country is here and the bottom of the country is here, and this is a total of 25 miles. But the distance following that edge of the country could grow indefinitely. And so that's, that's a launching point for thinking about fractals and looking at, at objects that have um, this property of being in a finite region but having infinite length. And the, the triangle example is take a triangle, equilateral triangle, cut each side in thirds and draw an equilateral triangle on there. And then cut each of those sides in thirds and draw an equilateral triangle. And so this is a sequence of shapes. And you can show that, you know, no matter how many times you, you apply this process, your whole weird looking polygon is never going to be bigger than, say, this circle. It's going to have finite surface area. It's bounded by like two or something, right? So the surface area is finite, but the distance around the perimeter grows indefinitely. And in the limit, you get an object whose perimeter is infinite, but whose surface area is finite. And that's happening because it's no longer a two-dimensional object. It's actually got a fractional dimension. So that's called a fractal. Not on the exam, but, you know, good to know for life. All right, so we will leave that at that. Um, now let's talk about recurrence relations, which is related to some of this. So a recurrence relation is a way of defining the nth term of a sequence 
as some function of the prior terms. So we're thinking about a sequence of numbers. For example, there's a sequence of numbers. And I'm going to call this, you know, um, term 1, term 2, term 3, term 4, term 5, term 6. And we know that this is just counting, right? But there's a different way we could define the elements of the sequence. Based on the observation that term n is the same as term n minus 1 plus 1 more. In other words, the sixth term of the sequence is just the fifth term plus 1. And so this is a recurrence relation. It's defining the nth term of the sequence as some function of the prior terms. In this case, take the immediately prior term and add 1. Ooh, Gabriel's horn. Yeah, definitely. Now, this definition only gets us most of the way to actually defining the nth term of the sequence. Because what is t1? Well, it's 1 plus t0. And what's t0? Well, it's 1 plus t minus 1. And, and we can keep asking that, but we're never going to actually find a number, right? So we need a base case. For example, t1 is equal to 1. And now if I want to know what's t2, well, this relation tells me t2 is 1 more than t1, and this tells me t1 is 1. So 1 plus 1, t2 is going to be 2. And yeah, this is just another brush past, you know, re, uh, mathematical induction, base case and an inductive step. All right, here's another sequence. We know these as powers of 2. But as a recurrence relation, we could describe this as follows. Term 1 is equal to 1. Term n is equal to twice term n minus 1. And this captures the same information as this. Or the observation that tn is equal to, you know, 2 raised to a power. And we can use recurrence relations for lots of things. If we look at the sequence of factorials, we could define that as term 1 is equal to 1, term n is equal to n times term n minus 1. That's a recurrence relation that describes factorials. So let's suppose we have a bacteria population. And suppose its population at time 0 is equal to 10. There's 10 little bacteria hanging out somewhere. And suppose the population doubles every hour. So we can immediately define a recurrence relation for the population at time t, where t is in hours, and simply state that the population at time t is equal to twice the population at t minus 1, and an initial condition that the population at time 0 is equal to 10. And there's our recurrence relation. Now, sometimes we can find a formula for the nth term of this sequence. And there's a few ways to do that. For example, we could observe that P1 
equals 2 times P0 equals 2 times 10. And P2 would be 2P1, which would be 2 times 2 times 10, which is 2 squared times 10. And P3, using this formula, would be 2 times P2. And since P2 is 2 squared times 10, 2 times P2 will be 2 cubed times 10. And from there, we could hypothesize that the population at time n is 2 to the n times 10. And this would be called a solution for that recurrence relation. It's, it's a formula that we can, we can plug in n and get our population out, or get the nth term of the sequence. And we can hypothesize this from looking at the pattern, but how would we prove that this is actually a formula for pn? that it's actually equal to 2 to the t nth times 10. What, what kind of proof would we use? Mathematical induction, exactly. Because, you know, we could do this to find P4. We'd say it's 2 times P3, which is 2 times 2 cubed, which is 2 to the 4th we can see how we could extend this one step at a time to any given value n. That's an invitation to use mathematical induction to see if you can take how you go from n to n plus 1 and generalize it. And if you can, that's all you need along with a base case, and you can use mathematical induction and prove something like this. So induction, recursion, recurrence relations all kind of related to each other. All right, let's talk about bunnies. How many people here have had a pet bunny? Awesome. I grew up with cats when I was a kid. We always had a cat. Bunnies are not cats. They are very different. And I broke my hip back in the 90s, and my, uh, my partner was worried I was going to get bored, so... Decided I should have a rabbit to take care of. So, yeah, rabbits will chase cats. Um, it's not like cartoons. A dog, a cat, and 13 chickens. You'd need a rabbit. That would, like, be a perfect combo. So rabbits are cool. Um, so let's look at... Um, dot slash get rabbit. Nice. Let's look at the population of rabbits. This is where Fibonacci series came from, um, I believe, was studying this question. So let's, let's, um, let's do an analysis of rabbits. So um, simplifying characteristics. One, rabbits are immortal. They live forever. Um, two, um, rabbits breed... monthly from two months forward. So newborn rabbit, one month old rabbit does not breed. When a rabbit gets to be two months old, it will breed every month. And they have uniform offspring. Okay, so this is a really simplified universe of rabbits. But let's look at what happens to the rabbit population across time. Okay, and this, this example will hopefully clarify um, these, these assumptions. So we're going to start with a pair of rabbits. I'm only going to work, work with pairs of rabbits, so I'm just going to write down one, and that means one pair. Okay, or you can do these like tribbles where they just, you know, produce offspring without having to mate. Um, but we'll, we'll just think about pairs of rabbits. So we're going to start with uh, one pair of rabbits. And I'm going to represent months like this. All right, so initial population, one pair of rabbits. We've had raccoons, possums, 
I'm guessing those are stoats or goats. And other critters eat chickens in the past, so a rabbit might necessarily... I don't think a rabbit would eat a chicken. Um, but other things might get chicken, might get rabbits, yeah. All right, start with one pair of rabbits. A month later, that pair of rabbits is now a month old. They're not old enough to breed yet. Okay. One month later, that pair of rabbits is now two months old. And so they have offspring. And so now you have a newborn pair of rabbits. So this is time going down like this. One month at a time. Okay, one month later, this first set of rabbits that was just born is now a month old. This set of rabbits is now another month old. And since these, this rabbit is, is older than um, a month, it's going to have another offspring. All right, the next month, each of these existing rabbits gets a month older. And now, these two rabbits are old enough to breed still. This one's not yet, right? But these two are old enough to breed, so you're going to have two new rabbits. The next month, all the rabbits get to be a month older. And now, these three are old enough to breed. And so you're going to get three new rabbits. So there's, there's this dividing line right here. You got to be past this line to be old enough to breed. All right, so next month, everyone gets a month older. And how many new rabbits will be born? Well, you have two, three, four, five rabbit pairs that are old enough to breed, so we'll get five new rabbits. And let's go one more. And so we have three, five, six, seven, eight rabbits that are old enough to breed. So those are the newborn population. And so let's look at what the rabbit population is over time. It started with one, and then one, and then one and one is two, one and one and one is three, two, three, four, five, three, five, eight, 5, 8, 10, 13, 8, 13, 16, 18, 19, 20, 21. And these are the Fibonacci numbers. These are the numbers that you get by starting with a pair of ones and then adding the two previous numbers. And so the recurrence relation looks like this. F of 1 equals 1. F of 2 equals 1 f of n equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. So that's the Fibonacci series. And it describes the population of rabbits after a certain amount of time. And it's not really a weird coincidence. Because what's going to happen in the next period of time... All the rabbits get a month older. And so the population at this period of time is going to be the same as the population here, because none of our rabbits have died. But any rabbits that are old enough to breed will also double their count in the population. And how many rabbits are old enough to breed here? Well, any rabbits that were a month old in the previous generation, which means any rabbits that existed two generations ago. In other words, the population at this point. So the population at this time is going to be the sum of this population and that population. And that's that recurrence relation for Fibonacci numbers. And this pops up in nature all over the place. If, if you look at a sunflower and you start in the middle and you count 
the number of, of seeds going in a spiral out to the end, you get a Fibonacci number. And the Fibonacci sequence itself is filled with, with all kinds of cool properties. For example, if you square any number, it's always the product of the numbers on either side, plus or minus 1. 8 squared is 64, 5 times 13 is 65. 5 squared is 25, 3 times 8 is 24. And there's lots of stuff in here, and the golden ratio comes out here, if you look at the ratio of, of uh, numbers in the sequence. Let's do one more example with bit strings. So, um, suppose you have a string of n bits. We can ask the question, does this contain two consecutive zeros? And more generally, how many n bit numbers can we write that do not contain two consecutive zeros? So let x of n equal number of n bit strings that do not have two consecutive zeros. And we'd like to find a formula for x of n. So if, if, um, if we have a one-bit string, a one-bit string is either a zero or a one, and neither of those contains two consecutive zeros. So there's two ways that, that we can write a one-bit string without consecutive zeros. If we have a two-bit string, there's all our possible two-bit strings, three of them, do not contain consecutive zeros. So x of 2 is equal to 3. If we have 3-bit strings, right, well that doesn't work, and that doesn't work, and that doesn't work, but the other 5 are all legal. So there's 5 3-bit strings without consecutive zeros. Okay, let's look at 4-bit strings. So here's a 4-bit string. And it's not allowed to contain consecutive zeros, two zeros in a row. Well, just think about this last digit. There's exactly two possibilities. Either this last digit is a 1, or this last digit is a 0. Agreed? So if this last digit is a 1, and the whole string is not allowed to contain two consecutive zeros, our only requirement on these three bits is that they don't contain a pair of consecutive zeros. And how many three-bit strings are there that don't contain two consecutive zeros? That's just x3, which we know is 5. But in general, you know, it's the number of n minus 1 bit strings without consecutive zeros. On the other hand, if our 4 bit number ends with a 0, what can we say about this bit? Is this bit a 0 or a 1? It's guaranteed to be a 1. Why? Because if it's a 0, we've got a pair of consecutive zeros. So if our 4-bit number ends with a 0, then this bit is a 1, and now we have to write a 2-bit number that contains no consecutive zeros. 
And how many ways can we do that? That's just x of 2. And you can extend this in general and show that x of n is equal to x of n minus 1 plus x of n minus 2. There's your recurrence relation. Here's your base case. And that's exactly the same situation for Fibonacci numbers. And so the Fibonacci sequence also tells us how many n-bit strings can be written without two consecutive zeros. So this pops up lots of different places. And that's just another example of, of some counting arguments and, and how this ties into um, a number of different areas. We've got a few minutes left. I'll just leave you with this little fact. Um, we won't prove this. There's, there's a way to derive this. Um, but it's weird enough by itself. So I'm just going to give you this formula. Remember we said sometimes we can solve recurrence relations. We can find a formula for the nth term. Well, it turns out you can do that for Fibonacci numbers. You can find a formula for the nth Fibonacci number. And it's a really interesting formula. So here's a formula for the nth Fibonacci number. And it's not even clear that this has any business giving us back an integer, but it does. And if you plug in n, this will give you the nth Fibonacci number. And there's a technique we can use to actually derive this, not just for Fibonacci series, but for other series that are similar, that have this recurrence uh, relation. But this turns out to be an exact formula gives you an integer and it's the nth Fibonacci. All right, so that's, that's our, our discussion on counting. Um, finish up the homework and, and turn that in Monday um, and then we'll talk about that next week. Um, and we're going to go on, we're going to start talking about graph theory on Monday. So next week we'll spend talking about graph theory, and then again last week we'll do um, automata and formal languages and grammars, theories of computation, and that will round out our course. So we're getting to the end. Um, more good stuff coming next week and the week after. All right, uh, sun is trying to come out. It's been sunny here a few times, so... Have a good afternoon, have a great weekend, and I will see you on Monday.